Bible, please. Numbers chapter 11. <clears throat> and we'll start at verse 16. Numbers 11 and verse 16. And if... Sorry. <coughs> do you want me to take this off? Or? It's mine. Okay. Um, Numbers 11, 16. And the Lord said unto Moses... Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon me, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for gathering us together on Sunday. I thank you for Sunday. It's a wonderful arrangement of yours to bring us all together as a local church to hear from your word, to sing your praises, and to go home and practice what we have seen in your word. Help me practice what I preach. Help us live what we confess to believe. And help us be... Thank you for letting us be your children. Please help us be worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we look at Numbers 11 and some background to what's going on. The children of Israel were doing their normal complaining. And the Lord had enough of it. And so at the beginning of Numbers chapter 11, God sends down fire to consume some of the children of Israel. I think God takes complaining a little bit more seriously than we do sometimes. Then some of the, each, after that episode, some of the Egyptians that had traveled with the children of Israel out of Egypt, then started the complaining up again. And the children of Israel that were not uh, Egyptians joined in. And the children of Israel... We're specifically this time complaining about the manna and the fact that they had no meat to eat. I think I would struggle with that diet too. <laughs> but God doesn't like complaining. He likes requests. It's a little bit different, right? Asking God, can you please send this? And God, why don't you ever do anything for me? Is a little bit different. So Moses, this time, joined with the children of Israel. But not complaining to the Lord with them, saying, God, why aren't you giving us meat? Instead, Moses started complaining to God about the children of Israel. He said, God, I've had enough of this. I'm at the end of my rope. I can't do this. I quit. And I think a lot of us have been there before. God, I can't do this. I've had enough of this. I quit. And the Lord comes to Moses and gives him a precious promise. He says in verse 17, And I will come down and talk with thee. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not alone. The title of this morning's message is O for the Ordinary. Not O the letter, but like the expression. O for the Ordinary. Number one, the need for the Ordinary. Let's look back at a previous verse in the same chapter, Numbers eleven fourteen. Just a couple verses before, Numbers 11, 14 says, Moses is talking to God. He's doing his complaining right now. He says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And in Moses complaining, he says a very important truth. God, this is too much. In today's terms, Moses was trying to preach. He was trying to run the children's ministry. He was trying to pass out tracts. He was trying to knock on people's doors. He was trying to serve tea. He was trying to organize area-wide wide events. And he was trying to take care of his family all at the same time. And it was just too much for one person. One man cannot do everything. Amen. There's a very interesting story. Happened on January 25th in 1990. Avianica, I don't know how that's pronounced, but I'm going I'm to guess that's how it works. Flight 52, all right? Flight 52 from Columbia crashed just 15 miles short of New York's Kennedy International Airport, killing 73 passengers. It was very close to its destination when it crashed. But the reason it crashed 
was the plane ran, ran out of aviation flu, fuel. Under international regulations, this should never have happened. An airliner must carry enough fuel to reach its destination. And on top of that, it must have enough fuel to reach an assigned alternate route, plus able have enough fuel to handle at least 45 minutes of delays. There should be plenty of fuel in this airplane. But due to low fuel condition, the Avianica pilots had requested priority, not emergency landing. So they were coming in, they were running low on fuel, they said, give us priority landing, but they didn't use the word emergency. Because the exact word emergency was not used, and due to heavy traffic, air traffic, and bad weather conditions, they got put on a holding pattern until the plane simply ran out of fuel. And this was Moses. He did not realize the emergency situation he was in, and he was running out of fuel. Instead of being in a place where he wanted to give up, Moses needed people who could go to the people and spiritually help them. People that would encourage Moses as he did the work of the Lord. People that would serve Moses and do anything Moses needed them to do. Now, the interesting thing is Jethro had kind of said something like this to Moses before. Remember back in Exodus, Moses' father-in-law comes to Moses and he says, Why are you judging all these people on your own? This is too much for one person to do. Here's what you should do. You should only take care of the biggest things and let all the smaller matters be handled by people that you appoint and trust. And Moses did that, and it was smart. But Moses had a problem with delegating. See, Moses, I mean, to be fair with him, the children of Israel were not the most faithful people to God he had ever met. But Moses was faithful to God, and so he tried to take everything into his own hands. He's like, I can handle this, I can do this, I'll lead all the people. And it was just not working. Moses needed managers for the um, social areas of his children of Israel to deal with the political and the social issues, right? Someone stole my rod. I don't know what they steal back then. All right? So you need a judge to go say, okay, pay him money back, whatever. I don't know how it works. All right? And Moses doesn't have to deal with people's rods getting stolen. All right? Moses needed that for the social issues. But Moses also needed it for the spiritual issues because Moses could not deal with and support the spiritual problems of millions of people. That's an impossible task, and Moses was feeling that. So Moses needed overseers, and Moses got the overseers. He didn't know he needed that. Again, I tell you, Moses is a bad delegator, but God comes to Moses and he says, Moses, this is what you needed, this is what you do. So let's look at the qualifications of the ordinary, and you'll see at the end of the message why I'm calling these people ordinary, even though they did an extraordinary task, but let's look at the qualifications of them. Numbers eleven sixteen. Numbers eleven sixteen. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand with thee. So the first thing that we see is that these people needed to be elders. That was the Lord's first requirement. He says, Whom thou knowest to be elders of the people. What are elders? People that are wise. People that are used to dealing with people's problems and helping people through them. People that had life experience. People who took initiative to help people when no one was asking them. Moses needed people who stood up to lead when there was no reward except for a job well done. These were not men who stayed home and complained about the spiritual needs of Israel. These were not people that stayed home and prayed that God would send some help to Moses. These were not people that prayed and complained that nothing was getting done in Israel. No, they were men who saw the needs of the people around them and chose to go out and help them, even if there was no reward involved. And Christianity today needs a lot more men like this. 
Men who are elders among their people, who in their small areas of influence say, I'm going to make a difference in that one person's life because I see that they need help. Yeah. And I don't know everything, but I know the Bible has the wisdom I need. And I don't have all of life's experiences, but I know that God has done something in my life. And all I want to do is give someone else a piece of that. And when you give someone a piece of that, then they are helped and you learn something from them. And you learn something from the experience of counseling them. And you learn something from God, what God is doing in your life as you're helping them. And so you can help two people. And two becomes four and four becomes eight. Why? Because you chose to leave your comfort zone and go and help one person. Moses needed people that were elders. But the second thing that people Moses needed was people that were officers. The verse says... Whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them. Moses needed people who proved that they wanted to lead people to follow God. Even when they didn't get the fancy title of Moses' chosen men. Do you get the pattern here? Moses isn't asking people that are inexperienced. He's asking people that have proven themselves. Proven themselves to help individuals, and now people that have proven themselves to be leaders. Moses needed people that oversaw the spiritual condition of people around them. That's what officer means. It means overseer. They looked at the state of, well, it wasn't Christianity back then, but of believers back then. And they said, look, we have this problem in Israel. And I know that I can't affect all of Israel, but I'll affect the tents around mine. Because that's where they live. They live in tents, right? I'll affect the five tents around me. I will lead my family to God. I will lead me to God. And I will lead one more family around me to God. They made the spiritual concerns of other people their own concerns. This is a very important biblical principle. Remember, the Bible says, bearing one another's burdens. Very, very important that when we see Christians around us struggling, that their pain is our pain, and their struggle is our struggle, and their lack of spirituality is our concern, because that's what intercessory prayer is. When the Bible tells us that we need to intercede for our nation, I am telling you right now that the number one top priority on my list of people that need intercession is Christians, because we're the people that create the change, right? Yeah. Our leaders need prayer, of course they do. But what good will the prayers for our leaders do if we don't change the two people around us? You know what I'm saying? Because the direction of a country isn't solely based on who's president or who's T-shot or who's whatever representative you have. The, the direction of our country is based on what your estate votes. And if we're not affecting the Christians around us and the estate around us, then Honestly, we don't have business complaining to God that our leadership is problematic because in all honesty, the people around us put him there. Yeah. We live in a democracy, sort of, you know. We vote for people to go into the power. That's what democracy is, right? We vote for people to go into power. If we're not affecting the voters, then how can we ask God to change the votes? These people that Moses needed, they looked out for worldliness in their area. They were ready to defend against it. This is one of the spiritual gifts that God mentions later in the New Testament. People that have the gift of oversight. They say, I know the Bible and I study the Bible and I look for truth. And when I see evil around me, I go after it because I don't want that affecting our culture. So in our church, when I see that someone is struggling spiritually or someone is letting sin into their lives, I'm going to be there to encourage them to stick with the truth because I'm an overseer. They fought against false teaching in Israel. They studied the scripture. They knew the laws of God. They were overseers of the people. And you know what's a blessing? Because they made it a practice to go and find, not that they went looking for sin necessarily. Do you know what I'm saying? There's some people that go around their whole life looking for problems, right? And if you look for problems, you're going to find them. But I tell you, it won't take us long in our culture today to find problems. So we don't have to look for them. They come looking for us. So when the problems start coming looking for us, then what we can do is Help that one person that's struggling with that. And with the blessing of that is when we help that one person, we start to learn what are the common pitfalls in our circles. And when we start learning what those common pitfalls are, we start being able to see in the future what people might fall into. 
That's being an overseer. You're looking, you're saying, look, our people keep, not saying our people, but let's say this community keeps struggling with this problem. I'm going to start putting guards in place to make sure we don't go into this again. For example, in Ireland, right, we have uh, abortion being legal. What's the next step possible? Eugenics, right? So what can we as Christians do? We can speak up against eugenics now before it becomes popular. What can we do? We can oversee, have vision for the future. The Bible says without uh, a vision, the people perish. We need a vision for the future as we're overseeing what's happening in our area. We need to look forward and say, these are the problems our nation is headed for. Let's speak up about them now before we get there so we can try to avoid as much sin as possible. That's, the over, that's what the overseer volunteers to do. So Moses needed elders. He needed overseers. And this is the next thing. He needed people that were ordinary. Notice that these men did not come from any special family lineage. Notice that these men did not come from a certain tribe. They were simply men who decided to embrace responsibility and become the spiritual leaders of their area, regardless of who they came from. See, meager beginnings do not determine your end. And these men did not let their home life define who they were. Amen. These men did not let their sins of their family define who they were. They did not let the sins of their culture define who they were. They said, I don't care if I'm from the least tribe. I don't care if I'm from the worst family. I'm going to decide to lead my culture in my area to do right. And you know what's amazing? They embraced responsibility. We have a problem in our culture, and I'm not saying it's a Christian problem, it's a society problem, right? It's our culture sometimes to run from responsibility. Here's what I mean. You ever heard this phrase, work smarter, not harder? Now look, I think it's a good idea not to work super hard when you're working dumb. I agree with that. But there's a part of our culture that encourages us not to work hard. Yeah. You ever heard that you should not take extra responsibility because it just means extra problems? That you should not be a manager, let them worry about the problems and you just worry about your tiny little circle? These are anti-biblical ideas. Yeah. The Bible says men and women in your areas rise up to lead. Be the leader. Take responsibility. Embrace it. It's not for Christian men to run from responsibility. And so when our culture tells us, look, go for the easy path, remember, that's not always true. Because the Bible doesn't tell us to only go for more responsibility when it has more reward. It says go for responsibility when it's the right thing to do. Because mm -hmm. sometimes there's no reward for doing extra, except for just knowing you're doing the right thing. So that's what these men did. They took extra responsibility when there was no reward because it was the right thing. There was a very interesting uh, story. There was this boy who was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1890. He was the third of eight children. At 11, he quit school to help the family with expenses. He got his first full-time job at $3.50 per week. That's pretty low. At 15, he got interested in automobiles and went to work in a garage at $4.50 a week. He knew he would never get anywhere without more schooling. So what he decided to do was he subscribed to a correspondence home study course on automobiles. Sounds like a person with a lot of initiative. Night after night, long days at the garage, he worked at the kitchen table by the light of the kerosene lamp. His next step was planned in his mind. A job with Freyer Miller Automobile Automobile Company of Columbus. So one day, when he felt ready, he walked into the plant. Lee Frayer was bent over the hood of a car. The boy waited. Finally, Frayer noticed him. Well, he said, what do you want? I just thought I'd tell you, said the boy, I'm coming to work here tomorrow morning. <laughs> well, the man said, oh, who hired you? Nobody yet, he said, but I'll be on the job in the morning, and if, you're not, if I'm not worth anything, you can fire me. <laughs> Early the next morning, the young man returned to the garage. 
Freyer was not yet there, so noticing that the floor was thick with metal shavings and accumulated dirt and grease, the boy got a broom and a shovel and set to work cleaning the place up. The rest of the, fu the boy's future was honestly very predictable. He went on to a national reputation as a racing car driver and automotive expert. In World War I, he was America's leading flying ace. Later, he founded Eastern Airlines. His name was Eddie Rickenbacker. Why did this boy change the world? Because he decided to change him. He decided that even though he was just an average person from a low-income family, that he would lead himself, that he would take initiative for himself, and that no matter what anyone else told him, he was going to do what was right. And when he wasn't getting paid hardly anything, he showed up to work. And when he had not yet gotten a job, he still worked. People like that do end up being leaders. And he led scores of men and influenced the entire world because he learned to lead himself. Now, in the New Testament, we also have elders. In the New Testament, elders are pastors. Pastors are the ones who are taking care of the spiritual well-being of the people around them. However, just as Moses needed help caring for the people of Israel, so pastors today need the help of the people in the church to lead the congregation. Men who help the pastor care for the people and the work of the ministry have no official title. So just as these men who were leading their individual people around them had no special title, they were just men who decided to be what God had called them to be. But we see that these men are in the New Testament. Acts 13 verse 2. Let's turn there. Acts 13 2. Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. As they, plural, ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So there were multiple men fasting, praying, serving, and God said, I want Paul and Barnabas. What's the concept? That men serve not because they're called, but because they're men. Does that make sense? These are ordinary men in the New Testament who just decided, because I'm a Christian, I serve, and that's it. Because I'm a Christian, I fast. Because I'm a Christian, I pray. And because I'm a Christian, I lead ministries in the church. That's what Christians do. And when God sees this kind of initiative in men, God says, all right, I want this one. Now, that can be kind of scary for some of us who don't really feel like God saying, I want this one, <laughs> right? But just to comfort you, God did not call every single person in the group into full-time ministry. But we have a problem that sometimes God doesn't seem to call enough. Yeah. And I have to ask myself, is it really that God doesn't call enough or that there's not enough in that circle for God to pick from? You see, these men put themselves in the way of the will of the Lord. Their idea was not, I want to become a pastor. Their idea is, I want to be a faithful Christian. Yeah. You see, Paul in the New Testament tells us something kind of profound. He says, after you do everything the Bible tells you to do, after you serve God with everything you've got, you still have to say, I'm an unprofitable servant. You know, I thought about that for a little bit, and it was kind of shocking to think about. That if I give everything to Jesus every single second, and I follow every command in the Bible, I'm an unprofitable servant because I'm simply doing what God has already asked me to do. A profitable servant, someone who adds value to the master, is someone who does above what the master asks. And there is nothing that we can do that is above what the Bible is already telling us to do. Try to love God more than all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Try to serve God 
than with everything within you. You can't. What is the Bible saying to us? You, God doesn't owe you some free time because you did a little bit of service. Instead, we owe God our lives because he gave us his. And that's the concept. That these men serve God in ministry. Now, no, they work full time. Of course, they work jobs. All okay, and we understand that, all right. But they gave God everything God asked them for, and followed the Bible as closely as they could, and served in ministry as much as humanly possible. Why? Because they understood they were already unprofitable servants, and they wanted to live as the Bible says, worthy of the vocation wherewith they were called. Now, before someone can be called into full-time service, there are some qualifications they have to fulfill. And when you read in 1 Timothy, and I'm not going to take the time to uh, go there, but when you read through some of the chapters in 1 Timothy 3 and so forth, you see qualifications of pastors and deacons, mm -hmm. right? But something very interesting when we cross-reference that with Acts, we learn not that God calls people and then they start automatically switching on a light bulb, I've got to fulfill all these qualifications. Instead, we have men of God already fulfilling these qualifications because, not because they want to be called into full-time service, although they're surrendered to it, but rather they want to be as close to God as possible. That's the idea. You see, there's two ideas in, in Christianity. The first idea is how much can I get away with, right? I didn't read that um, people that were not pastors don't have to go near wine, so I'm good to go, right? The Bible doesn't say thou shalt not smoke, so I'm good to go. The Bible doesn't talk about my type of music, so I'm good to go. That's one idea in Christianity. And the other idea in Christianity is I want to get as close to Jesus as possible. So if I see in the Bible a principle that tells me I need to change something, then I do it. If the Bible says that pastors have to do all these different things, then maybe the reason God lists that out for pastors is because that's what he expects of his closest servants. Yeah. You see, Abraham was called the friend of God. God doesn't call just everyone his friend like that. You see, we're all children of God, and Jesus is our brother, as, as described in the New Testament. But the close friendship does not come, unfortunately, when we want to get away with as much as possible. You see, the close friendship comes from when we're willing to relinquish anything we have, including our money, our time, and our dreams, and put it on the altar of God's will. And I want to tell you something, God never lets it burn up in vain. Because God doesn't give you gifts to laugh at you and say, I'm never going to use those. God doesn't give you money to say, well, you can throw that away. God doesn't give you time to say, well, let's see how much of this we can waste. God gives you everything you have because he has a best plan for it. See, I in my life don't want a good life. I want an impossible life. Yeah, amen. You see, the difference between a good life and an impossible life is my good life is my ideas and following the Bible as much as it demands I absolutely have to. But my impossible life is doing the things in the New Testament that other people say, that doesn't happen. You see, the people in Acts, now look, when we read Acts 1 and 2, there were specific things going on. But as a pastor once said, I'm not concerned about the debate of whether or not this could happen again. I'm concerned that we don't want it to happen again. Yeah. He said, it's not about, look, it's not going to happen that everyone in the church sells everything they own to support people that are homeless. It's not going to happen again that 5,000 people get saved after a layman gets healed. Look, we don't have the gifts of healing anymore. That's not the idea. The idea is... Do we want it to happen again? I mean, if God came down and gave us the gifts of tongues and healings again, would we want it enough to go into all the world and preach the gospel? If God gave us Christians that were persecuting and dying and had no homes and no clothes, would we sell everything we have to support them? If God said, go ye out into the world, sell your home and go move into an area an hour away, 
And I'm not saying God's going to tell you that, but are you willing? That's the question. Because these Christians in Acts were not concerned about what does it cost me. This is very important. Look, the following Christ has a cost. Yeah. And it's, it's terrible if we don't pe tell people that before they get saved. And it's terrible if we keep that from people when they get saved. Look, when Jesus, the rich ruler came to Jesus, he said, sell everything you have. Not because that's the way of salvation, but because that's what he valued more than God. And when God, when another man said, I want to follow Jesus, Jesus went straight for the thing that held him back. And he said, then leave your father and mother and let the dead bury their dead. Not because Jesus was cruel, but because he was getting at the crux of the matter. They hadn't counted the cost. And the question is today, have you already counted the cost? You see, there's, there's Christianity where every little step we take, we count a cost. Is this worth it again? But there's a different type of Christianity that says, look, I know my way doesn't work. I know my sin was a problem. I know that I was dead in trespasses and sin. I wasn't dying. I was dead. I was gone. And Jesus rescued me. And I am done measuring if this is worth doing it to God, if it's nice to wake up early in the morning to go to a prayer meeting, if it fits within my schedule to go witness to people with the church, if, if it suits me to show up to church. I'm done measuring all these things. And I'm just saying, look, Christianity is going to cost me, but it's worth it. So anything that I read in the Bible, I'm just going to apply. Lord, help me apply it. Because it's a different mentality. These Christians in Acts, the disciples of Jesus, they already counted the cost. They said, all right, it's worth it. Now, no more resistance. Amen. The next thing about these men that Moses needed was that these men needed to come to the tabernacle. Let's look at Numbers eleven sixteen again. Let's turn back with me, please. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 16. Numbers eleven sixteen, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. These men had to come to the tabernacle. You say they could you see they could not stay home and hope everything would turn out for Moses. They had to stand up with Moses in front of everybody and take the blame when things went bad and take some of the credit when things went good and pray that God would make it work out and just give everything to God. There's a film that I watched in the there's a line in that, that says, leave everything on the field, give it to God, and let him worry about the results. In the same film, they said, when we win, we praise him. When we lose, we praise him. Look, the concept is these men said, look, I know it's going to be embarrassing when we mess up in front of everybody. And I know it's going to be hard when they're all complaining and they're not just complaining to Moses. They're complaining to me now. And it's going to be a problem when we follow God and we see blessing and the people aren't satisfied. But God needs this. And he wants me, and I'm just going to do it. I'm going to stand up in front of everybody and take the responsibility. See, these men stood in the gap. Ezekiel 22, 30 to 31 no need to turn there, but it says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. What a sad statement of the children of Israel. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. If we get to a point in Christianity where we see the wrath of God, if we get a po to a point in Christianity where we see God is not blessing, He's not sending revival, He's not giving us what we see in the Bible, then we need to ask ourselves, am I the man or the woman standing in the gap? Am I the one that God can come and find as being faithful? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, if I find 10 righteous people, I will not destroy it. God couldn't find 10. May God find us here in this room faithful. 
May God find us the ones standing in the gap like these men that Moses needed. And the, and the last qualification of these men was they got their strength from God. Let's look at the last end of that verse, verse 16. And bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. Sorry, in verse 17. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take the spirit which is upon thee, and I will pour it upon them. Isn't that such a blessing? Amen. God will take his spirit and pour it upon us. And I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. God says, this, what I'm calling them to do, is impossible. But I will give them my spirit to make it probable. You see, when we look at a situation and see this is impossible with God's Holy Spirit and with God's direction and in His Word saying it should happen, it moves from impossible to probable. And that's what God did with these men. They carried the responsibility of the nation in the strength of God alone. So we looked at the need for the ordinary. We looked at the qualifications of the ordinary. And lastly, let's look at the spirit of the ordinary. Numbers eleven seventeen again. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee. And I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the, per the burden of the people with thee. That thou bear it not thyself alone. God said to Moses, see the spirit that I have given you. This Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, I will pour it on upon them. Now today, as believers, we all have that same Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to us at the moment of salvation. And so if we think that these men were different than us, we're right. They had a disadvantage. They didn't have the Spirit yet. We already have that Spirit. As children of God, whether you're male or female, you have that Spirit of God. You can lead your home in righteousness. Now let's turn to Acts 4, 13. Last part, last verse that we're going to turn to today. Acts 4, Acts 4, 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to look at what it looks like to be full of of the Spirit of God. Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them. And I love this phrase, that they had been with Jesus. Now look, Peter and John had just healed a lame man through the Spirit of God. God was using those gifts in those days. They healed a lame man. And after praising God for the miracle, they started preaching to the crowd that gathered around this amazing miracle. 5,000 men, not even including the women and children, got saved. Peter and John were then arrested by the religious leaders and interrogated for daring to preach that there will be a resurrection of believers through the power of Jesus Christ. This is their response. If this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent men, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and this is back to verse 13 we're in again, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, guess what? They could not, they could say nothing against it. Because when Jesus works, it's not about how flashy we are. It's about that when Jesus works, the unsaved, the persecutors, the blasphemers can say nothing 
against it. The question I have for us today is, can people see that we have been with Jesus? Peter and John did not just have a conversion experience. They had not just been baptized. They had not just shown up to Jesus' important events. They had lived the ministry. They had breathed the ministry. As the Bible says, they had been addicted to the ministry. They had given up everything, family ties, secure incomes, houses, dreams, to partake in following Jesus' ministry. Get this, they dreamed about a ministry they didn't even lead. And when Jesus suffered on the cross, they suffered with him. And when Jesus was buried in a tomb, they felt the depression. And when Jesus was risen from the grave, they had new life again. Because they had experienced the power of the resurrection. In a short phrase that the Bible says, they had been with Jesus. When you have been with Jesus, guess what? As an ordinary believer, you don't even have to go to Bible college. You don't have to be the smartest person in the area. You don't have to know as much as the people you're sharing Christ with. You don't have to be the most intelligent. You are ordinary, as the Pharisees call them, unlearned men. But they had been with Jesus. And when you've been with Jesus and you have his Holy Spirit, he gives you the words to say. The Bible says, but when they deliver you up, take no thought, how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father which is in you. It was the Spirit of God speaking to those religious leaders. And it is that Spirit of God that God puts in ordinary men and women today. Again, God doesn't just use the gifted. He doesn't just use the powerful. He doesn't just use those with good backgrounds. God uses the ordinary person fully surrendered to his Holy Spirit. So what's the call? God's calling today because he needs ordinary volunteers. He needs ordinary men and women that decide that their plan for life isn't really as important as his. That they don't need a full-time calling to serve and lead ministries. They just need to be a Christian with the gift of the Holy Spirit that they already have. These people still gently search the scriptures to fulfill the qualifications of those who serve God. Not because they're ministers but because they're servants of Jesus Christ and they're debtors to his love. These are the people that God can put anywhere, at any time, at any cost, just because they love their Savior. And if we see more of these people, I'm sure we will see more full-time ministers and servants of Jesus Christ. Our prayers will be answered when we put the feet to our prayers. May God... Fill this church with such volunteers. And may I be the first one. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. <laughs>